I'll be talking about whether computers can create art. Um, this is a discussion that's going around for decades. I've been giving versions of this talk for about four years now and updating it and revising it uh, all the time. But I think this year, the, the conversation has really kind of changed and maybe not in the content, but in the the, the intensity or how, how wide the conversation is going. Um, so it's a really interesting time to be uh, having this discussion. But a lot of these themes I think you'll see uh, have been going on for a very long time. Um, and just a little bit about myself. Um, I researcher, I work in uh, developing algorithms for making uh, for doing computer graphics for uh, understanding images. And a lot of it has to do with uh, making artistic images as well as the visual perception of art. Uh, and I also like to paint and draw uh, as a hobby. Uh, I, I studied both computer science and art in my in college. And in my undergraduate school, these things were in separate departments and separate worlds. I did some computer art um, you know, in, in that time and my art professors had no idea what to make of it. Um, and then I attended SIGGRAPH and that you know, really changed my life. Um, and then in my PhD, I developed a lot of methods for making paintings based on my art experience. And this is one installation piece that came out of my PhD that was shown in some art festivals in New York around uh, 2001. Um, but now I, I really think there's this, this new excitement that's happened within the past um, few years in around AI driven art. And I, I really date this back to did a deep dreams from 2015 that got a lot of attention for a short amount of time is very uh, briefly exciting. Um, and this is where the, the things started to happen with uh, neural networks and uh, uh, image creation. Um, there was the neural style transfer method that led to a, a few uh, apps uh, and stylization filters that were quite popular. Um, and people started using neural networks for all kinds of things for making movie scripts and uh, cool band names for Coachella. Um, and all these fun applications of neural generated knitting patterns, um, the, you know, and lots of other stuff. And the first sort of art gallery experience I saw here in San Francisco was in 20, 2016 in this event sponsored by Google, showing artworks um, created with uh, deep dreaming with neural style transfer. Um, and, you know, within a few years, this was satirized in the TV show Silicon Valley. This is 2018. I like it. It's really cool. So who painted it? A machine. It's actually the first work of art made by AI to be sold at Sotheby's. So that was satire. Six months later, this uh, work was very publicized, sold for half a million dollars at Christie's, um, and it was signed with a loss function uh, for GANs. Um, and now this year, text image methods like Dolly, Imagine, um, uh, Stable Diffusion, and, and several others, Midjourney, uh, have become, you know, have gotten a lot of attention. You type in a piece of text and you out comes these really interesting and often really cool images. And so this is a very exciting time to be working in this space. Um, within the academic world, there's been a you know fair amount of strong things people have said. So in one paper from 2017, the authors wrote in the paper, we propose a new system for generating art. The system generates art by looking at art and becomes creative. So these are very strong statements, but if you know it's making these pictures that look really cool and interesting, maybe it's making art. Um, these things get picked up in the media. So new scientists, artificial intelligent painters invent new styles of art, or you know, going down the food chain in Daily Mail, the art, AI artist that can create its own painting style and critics prefer its work to human efforts. So this is really percolating through the, uh, the media uh, in how it's presented and how people understand it. So this is all from, these are both articles from 2017. Um, now, see the, the way that things are presented. So here's uh, Jerry Saltz, who's one of the you know, preeminent art critics in the world, talking about some of the, the images from that, the, the CAN algorithm. And the, really the thing to see is what kind of agency he gives to the algorithm. Initial thoughts, incredibly dull, generic, boring. The programmers are not freeing up the program. I want the robot to tap into its inner robot. Be free. So it's hard to tell if this is serious or not. It seems like it might be, but he's, you know, he's really accepted the idea. It's just the robot is the artist. Uh, and it's just that the artist is just not, you know, not being let to run free enough. That, that's, that's the reason these aren't very good artworks in, in his opinion. So it, it, really the idea is that, of course, these things are the artists is assumed. Um, but I think this is a question worth, uh, you know, thinking about a little bit more carefully. And when people ask when computers, whether computers can be artists, I think it's worth thinking about what exactly does that mean? Or what exactly is the question that we're asking? Um, and the way I would pose that is, um, well, I want to say that sometimes people ask it like a technological thing, like they'll say, um, you know, are computers good enough now to be artists? Um, just, just assume that they could be. Um, and 
sometimes that I ask people um, this question, they, they say, of course not, art requires intent in some form. Um, and I think we, a lot of us have an intuition that art is a purely human thing. It's like, you know, having consciousness or like having a soul. Some of these ideas feel a little religious and it'd be nice to have a more scientific basis for what exactly the, the claim is here. And so the way I would pose this problem is really is in terms of whether we will ever credit the AI or the software, the algorithm as the author of the artwork and not the person who operated the software, or ran it or wrote it or anything like that. Uh, and the main points I wanna make here at first is that AI tools, like all of our other technologies are tools for artists. They advance art and they empower artists. They give new creative capabilities to all kinds of people. Um, they're not themselves artists. Um, I, uh, moreover, the, the rationale I, I think, um, which I'll explain is that only social actors can make art. And really this means humans or people. Um, and when we call computer artists, this is actually potentially harmful in various ways that I'll talk about. And when I say social actors, I mean also something very specific. Um, now there are scenarios in the future where we could uh, consider AI to be artists. I think these are really unlikely and they're really not something that's gonna happen anytime soon or perhaps within our lifetimes. Okay, so in order to uh, explain these points, I first want to provide a lot of background. I want a lot of context and the fact that technology is something that's always transformed art. These, you know, what we you know consider art has has changed a lot through the, over the centuries, and art has been one uh, technology has been one of the driving forces that has caused some of this transformation. Um, so, for example, in the 15th century, uh, Van Eyck uh, developed uh, you know practical oil paint methods, and this really provided a lot more. Uh, artistic uh, expressiveness to artists, both in terms of the convenience of the work, as well as the ability to capture tones and colors and this sort of rich detail um, that's present in the right that's not in the left. So this is one example of a technology transforming the nature of the art form. Um, in the Western tradition since then, there was quite a um, steady you know, progress towards more and more realistic and more expressive uh, kinds of visual art. And so by the 19th century, um, artists using oil paint technologies were able to do things that were extremely uh, either realistic or expressive and luminous, beautiful in all kinds of different ways. And really, you know, as um, us in our current lives are, we're so saturated by photographic imagery. It's, I think it's a little bit hard to imagine just how special it must have been to go into a gallery um, or, you know, museum or salon and see an image like this that you could not have seen it any other way. Like, and so the idea, the identity of what an artist was, was highly tied into creating these kinds of visual images because um, that it requires skill and talent as well, you know, and as well as aesthetic uh, judgment. So this would all would change with the invention of the photograph. Um, and this here I'm showing you is the very first photograph. Technically it's a different uh, technology in the photography, but I'll, I'll just call it, lump it all together as technology, as, as photography. Um, and these were all amateurs, tinkerers, playing around with the tools, just experimenting just for fun. Um, you know, here's the very first time someone Instagrammed their own food in 1837. Um, this, this is a picture that Daguerre took outside of his window. It's roughly, I think, a, I forget, a 10 or 30 minute exposure. Um, now the street looks empty because everyone walking by is blurred out, except that there's a, a person standing in the lower uh, left there who's having a shoe shined. And this is most likely the, the very first person who was ever photographed. Um, here's the first selfie from 1838, but things really started to change when Daguerre publicly announced his invention of how to uh, do this, you know, the Daguerreotype precursor to modern photography. Um, and because the French government viewed this as potentially valuable for um, uh, everyone, they bought him out so he didn't patent it. And so this is, became something where anyone with enough skill uh, and the right chemicals could do that, could make these pictures. And from the very beginning, artists who saw this uh, felt threatened. So Paul Delaroche, a classical painter of the time, was is reported to have said, from today, painting is dead. And the great Turner said, this is the end of art. I am glad I've had my day. So this tool, which makes images, seems to be doing the thing that artists do, and which is uh, to make realistic pictures. Um, so what effect did it have? Well, the actual effects of photography were quite varied. So. So let's look at the case of portraiture. If you know, if you wanted to have a picture of yourself, or your family, or your friends or ancestors, you had to hire a painter. So this is only available to the very wealthy. Um, another option was silhouette portraiture, which would just give this sort of black and white cutout. This is much more affordable, but it's obviously you know not a, not a very um, 
uh, detail and likeness. And so once photography uh, took off in the following decades, um, portrait, portrait artists and portrait uh, silhouette artists, that, that their whole profession was displaced or really replaced. So people who had painting studios ended up replacing them with portrait studios and they had to learn this new technology, even though um, uh, photography was still quite impractical. You had to sit still for 10 minutes and um, you know, this, this fellow here is clamping his armrest and he probably has his head in a brace to hold still. And even as a result, we have these um, portraits from this time that have such incredibly rich detail that were not achievable with um, the existing technologies or artist skills. Um, and so as just an example that, you know, th this photography was very much involved with skill and talent. Um, George Sand, the great author, uh, she wanted to have her own portrait taken, and she went to kind of a cheaper, uh, lesser photographer, and he came out with this portrait, and she hated it. She wanted to destroy it, and it really doesn't reflect, you know, doesn't really convey her stature as a, you know, great thinker or intellectual of her day. She went to Nadar, who is this very colorful and talented and really interesting character to learn about, all the crazy stuff he did. They, he, um, he took this portrait of her over this long session and long time, and this is clearly a much better uh, portrait and much better photograph in lots of ways. And it really reflects his technical skill and his artistry as a photographer. Um, within a few decades, uh, one painter photographer here is saying that photography has harmed painting, painting considerably and killed portraiture once the livelihood of the artist. So people were concerned about uh, artists losing their jobs and they were seeing it happen. Um, now at the high end of the spectrum, there's the long standing question, is photography art? And on one hand, again, there were these tinkerers, the hobbyists, people with enthusiasts playing around. And in the initial days, a lot of the photography that came out, it's fine. Like, it's not like it was a great art form right away. Um, in sort of the seeking to create great art images, uh, the photographers would always imitate the, what, the style of the conventional art medium. So in this case, this is a very composed, uh, uh, tableau in this style of conventional art with multiple exposures and, you know, sort of grand themes. This is another one from the, the same photographer. Um, this is called pictorialism. They're creating these pictorial images very much the same way that a painter might. Um, and within a few decades, um, the pictorialists and the photo secessionists, they had their own salons and studies and journals. And eventually, within, um, I guess, about 60 years later, there was the first um, acceptance of photography within mainstream art institutions. And so at this point, then photography was accepted as an art form uh, at the same level as painting. So it, it took a long time um, to the, develop the art form, but eventually it was really recognized as an art form commensurate with the other ones that we recognize. On the other hand, during this whole time, there were the, the haters. So here's a grumpy Charles Baudelaire who reviewed a photography salon saying, if photography is allowed to stand in for art, it will corrupt it completely thanks to the stupidity of the multitude you know, presumably all of us here. Um, but really the interesting thing is that this was a challenge to the painters of the time. Um, so Whistler wrote, the imitator is a poor kind of creature. If the man who paints only the tree or flower or other surface he sees before him were an artist, the king of artists would be the photographer. And it's the artist, it is for the artists to do something beyond, beyond this. So the um, artist's uh, role was being questioned. And so they rethought what it means to be an artist. It's being an artist is something that photography can't do. Uh, Van Gogh, in his uh, pivotal year of 1888, wrote to his brother, accurate drawing is not the essential thing to aim at because the reflection of reality in the mirror would not be a picture at all, no more than just a photograph. And so we see this trend away from realism, you know, against real, away from realist colors, and we essentially the entire modern art movement. And I think it's actually plausible to say that we would not have had modern art if it weren't for photography causing artists to rethink what it is to be an artist. And indeed, in the 20s, the uh, Dadaists said that the invention of photography dealt a mortal blow to the old modes, modes of painting, since a blind instrument ensured artists of achieving the aim that they had previously set themselves up for, they now aspired to break free themselves of the imitation of appearances. So modern art is really, at least in part, a product, a, 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 an effect of the invention of photography. So to summarize this whole story here around photography, it first looked like photography automated art because it automated some of the things that artists thought were their identity. Uh, and many artists at the time feared it and disparaged it. What actually ha uh, came out of it is this new art form of photography, as well as maybe making people rethink what the old art forms were. It, it completely transformed what we think of as being art. 
um, portraiturists and, and a few other kinds of more practical uh, image makers were replaced with photo studios. Um, but also, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that image creation is made available to hobbyists. People who are not professionals can make these kinds of images. And now we pretty much all carry phones around in our pockets. We can take pictures whenever we want. And we have a lot of, a lot of people have the opportunity to make artistic images with their phones that they would not have had before. So the definition of art transformed a lot. Um, there's a lot to say about the different people things, things people have said about it. For the time being, I just want to say like a simple definition of art is like whatever an artist does can be art. Um, and this is one of the pivotal conceptual art pieces. And there's lots more to say about the history around that, that idea. Um, and I also want to say for the purpose of this talk, really art is, is a very broad term. It can refer to painting and conceptual art, music, dance, movies, theater, and so on. Um, even though I'm, my focus here is often quite a bit on visual art because that's what I you know care about the most. Uh, one of the important things that came out of the conceptual art movement, or one of the, actually the important stages in conceptual art, was um, a lot of these procedural methods, like you know John Cage would roll dice to produce poetry in the Fluxus movement, um, but Saul Witt in particular was um, would write these long um, descriptions of how to make a painting. The rules were draw a line here, draw a line here, and so on, and then fill in this color with paint. And he wrote these long essays about how the artwork were the instructions and not the painting itself. And in fact, um, you can buy a Solowit now um, by having you know, it being erased from the old wall and having the people from his estate come and paint it on your own wall. And so this was this idea that the, um, uh, the, the art was in the instructions and the concept uh, came in part from this uh, work. And he wrote that the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. It's really the idea and not the, the physical object itself in his view. Um, now, as soon as computers were created, um, people started to experiment with them. What can we? Do, how, what can they do to make pictures? Um, and these are a few examples from the 1960s. So this is before we had displays, before we had uh, any kind of way to show pictures on screen. They used plotters. Before we had programming languages, people were plugging in and making, writing little programs that would produce really cool little abstract art. And the, people have been doing this ever since then. Um, but one of the most important AI artists of the 20th century is Harold Cohen. Uh, he was trained as a classical or conceptual artist painter uh, in Goldsmiths, and he started out in the 60s. He would set, he would write a bunch of rules for himself, and then he would like paint these paintings by following his own rules. And then he discovered Fortran, and it's like, well, why am I uh, writing, doing the rules myself? Um, and so he started writing code, and for the rest of his career, he essentially wrote more and more sophisticated programs that would produce the paintings, and his work is exhibited uh, and collected by a lot of the major galleries and museums. And I'll have a lot more to say about him later. Um, with it, by the 80s, computer-based art became more widely popular. There were uh, Mac Paint and uh, drawing tools. This is the painting made by Andy Warhol. Along the way, every time these uh, new developments happen, people are asking, is it really art? Is computer art? Can a computer be a tool for creative personal expression? And with a big question mark. Um, now, there's this enormous history of generative artwork that I'm completely skipping over, but I just want to mention uh, one example is uh, evolutionary artwork, which use one of the, what was, you know, uh, evolutionary algorithms, which is considered an AI algorithm, especially the work of Carl Sims and Scott Draves, who both have variations where you crowdsource different people wrote, uh, voting which pictures or which generative um, things they like the most, and then new versions, new procedures are evolved as a result of this. Uh, computer animation is a world which has a similar history. It's really arose from a close collaboration of artists working together with scientists. Certainly when I you know, talk to people at Pixar who don't you know, have any exposure to the gra graphics research world, they say, oh, the computer is just like making all the animation. And it's really not, that's not really the, how it works. Um, and indeed in the early days, um, in, when Ali Ray Smith and uh, Ed Catmull would travel down to Disney and try to convince them to adopt computer technologies, the animators were frightened of the computer. They felt it was gonna take their jobs away. And they spend a lot of time telling people it's, it's not a tool, it's just a tool that doesn't do the creativity. And indeed, if you look at any computer animation interface, um, like the ones used, used to make the Pixar movies, they're extraordinarily labor intensive tools. It is very hard work, skilled and creative uh, work. And they always you know, said that art challenges the technology and the technology inspires art. Um, and indeed what happened, now we have so much graphics and visual effects film, you know, and that's why you know you watch the credits for any feature film, they go on and on and on because it requires and so many people employ so many talented artists to create uh, these, these feature films. 
Um, <clears throat> now, uh, these concerns are, you know, actually you know, can be quantified a little bit. There's something called status quo bias, and there's a paper published recently. There's a, a you know, bunch of documentation of it, but in particular, this recent paper um, shows that if you ask people whether a particular technology will be uh, have a positive or negative impact, their um, response depends on whether the year you tell them it was invented is before or after they were born. So you tell someone the exact same technology, but you give them a, a later uh, year for its invention, and they will say, oh, I don't know about that. That's a little bit risky. And so there's this sort of natural uh, tendency to uh, be concerned, more concerned about new inventions rather than, than old things. Um, and <clears throat> this, is, this is not to say you know, that um, uh, we shouldn't critically think about the impact of new technologies, but there's, there's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to say, oh, this new technology is coming, it must be bad because it's gonna eliminate this the thing we had before without really thinking about the potential new things it's gonna create that we don't really know about. Um, now, in my own experience, um, you know, speaking of what is involved in making these pictures, like I wrote a bunch of code, like I mentioned, so this is my SIGGRAPH 98 paper. This, my code in this paper takes a photograph and makes a painting out of it, and I can tell you how that code works and all how it makes its decisions, even though it's an algorithm. Um, and this is, uh, like I said before, the installation version of that. Um, I also came up with a method that was used machine learning. So starting with a photograph, and in this case, a pastel illustration, um, we would apply the style of the pastel illustration to the photograph. And so this is because I didn't want to have to write a bunch of code to figure out, I don't know how to write code to do this pastel style. I'll just learn it from an example. And this was my, my SIGGRAPH 91 paper. And even though these are algorithms and they are um, automatic and they're making pictures on their own, they're, all of these things are all human-made things. I wrote a bunch of code for that thing. Lots of different intelligent people have made computer-generated art algorithms, but they're all things that people made by writing that code. Um, and even a lot of the AI artists now, they talk about the same thing. So one of my favorite AI artists is Helena Saren, and she talks about how um, working with GAN is a lot like working with watercolor. When you work with watercolor, if you've ever tried it, you know it It kind of has a mind of its own, and you have to like, kind of work with, how, figure out how to get it to do cool things. You don't just control it. And then she describes uh, using GANs a lot, a lot of the same way. Um, here's you know the curation process by one of, another one of my favorite AI artists. He, uh, in this case, he was curating his training data by with this kind of Tinder-like interface that he created. Now, he has a more recent uh, system called Bato that's really, really cool, and that's much more of a distributed evolutionary curation, um, similar to the evolutionary artwork that I described earlier. So to summarize this whole discussion, people have been using computers to make art for over 50 years. Um, and with each of these developments, people are asking the same questions. Oh, is the computer the artist? Can computers be creative? Can they be... Um, independent in some way. Is it really art? And, you know, within a few decades, the answer is, of course, they are. Of course, people accept photography and computer animation as art forms. Um, the computer has always been a tool. It's in um, this AI algorithm is just software. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. So this issue with AI is that there's all this, like I mentioned earlier, all this hype around it. So even in 1958, um, the the Lo Larry Rosenblatt's uh, announcement from the Navy, uh, and they said this is an algorithm they expect will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. And this was a pro this was the development of the perceptron in 1958, which was a sim simple linear classifier, uh, and the promising consciousness. Um, this has just been going on. So 2017, artificial invented intelligent painters invent new styles of art. And then earlier this year, computer designed uh, the, the cover and similar for the cosmopolitan cover. Um, so we live in this eternal present of hype around AI being uh, artists. And I feel like a lot of this comes out of these fictional narratives we have about AI in our society. AI is either terminators or our best friends. Um, and really, I like Brenda Laurel's uh, statement here. She said that computers are a projection service for our hopes and fears about what it means to be human. So we, we tell these stories in our uh, fictional culture around robots that are really versions of ourselves, which are wonderful stories and wonderful fictions, but they don't really, uh, they're not true to what AI really is in the real world. Um, uh, in reality, AI is not intelligent. It is a bunch of software. And I really like this article by Rodney Brooks sort of stepping through a lot of the details here, but anything we people are calling AI, a much better term for it would be software. And that's why I'm putting quotes around it. Like I, I 
it, I think we would be better off as a culture if we just never even said the word artificial intelligence uh, seriously. And part of the issue is that we have this really strong tendency to anthropomorphize uh, artificial systems if we don't understand them. So like the classic example is the Eliza system, very simple chatbot from 1966. And there are cases where people thought it was a real person or they got emotionally involved in it, um, even though it was just a you know very, very, very simple software. And this sort of effect is happening more and more these days. Um, so AI really is a bunch of software, you know, data fitting or something. What we call machine learning today, for the most part, it's fitting high dimensional curves and high dimensional data sets. It's basically statistics 101, super hyper turbocharged. Um, and this has a real impact in the world. There are these things that are presented as AI, as intelligent systems, um, are, can be used to take over decision making or to um, uh, give, be given autonomy and responsibilities for decision making that can cause real harm to real people in the real world. And part of this is a result of this myth of an intelligent AI when it's really software that people wrote and designed and trained. So I actually think it's potentially harmful to call computer art, computers artists because it supports the notion of AI sentience. The idea that this is, when, when you say that some, something is an artist, people will infer to it all these you know, human-like properties of sentientness and conscious consciousness when it's really just software that somebody wrote. And I think there's a lot of harms uh, in, in doing that. Okay, so that's this is all about the present um, and what we know so far and what we've built so far. But there's still this question for the future. Maybe this can change someday. The definition of art does change over time and it's different in different cultures. And so it's completely plausible that our notion of art can change such that artists, uh, computers can be artists. Um, and again, it's a really hard question to figure out the right way to pose it. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? So this is the sort of like the, the obvious question is if you can make a beautiful picture that makes you an artist. And that's sort of a lot of thing a lot of people think, uh, including myself perhaps at one point. Um, now, I just want to like, you know, temper this by saying it's hard to make good long term predictions. So if you had asked people 60 years ago, tell me about the city of the year 2000, they would say, or the city of the future, they would say, well, we'll be riding to work on our moon buggies in our moon bubbles on the on the moon. If you had asked people in the 1950s or 60s, tell me about the computer of the year uh, 2001, they would say, well, it should be small enough to fit in the room and uh, calculate 100 digits of pi in less than a minute. So our notion of the future is often way, way off. It's very hard to make these, these really good predictions. And now we're just hearing these predictions about AI, which are just all over the place, um, which uh, um, you, know, you can see all these examples. Um, and that's sort of a case study about how these sort of um, these notions evolve. Again, this idea that uh, you know, if the algorithm is making art artistic pictures and makes it an artist, I want to look at uh, Harold Cohen's thought process. And this is his a talk that he gave at SIGGRAPH uh, when he received a, uh, a Distinguished Artist Award. Ten years after that, I would have said, look, the program is doing this on its own. Another 10 years on, and I would have said, the fact that the program is doing this on its own is the central issue um, here. It was producing complex images of a high quality, and I could have had it go on forever without rewriting a single line of code. How much more autonomous than that can one, can one get? So I made it an algorithm which is making art images that's being shown in art galleries. Does that make it an artist? Well, of course, that's exactly the point. It's virtually impossible to imagine a human being in a similar position. The human artist is modified in the act of making art. For the program to have been similarly self-modifying would have required not merely that it be capable of assessing its own output, but that it had an, its own modifiable worldview to provide a basis for any meaningful assessment. So this is something I think which is pretty common. Lots of people, including myself, have thought, well, if my algorithm is making uh, pictures that are high quality art, then that makes it an artist. 
And then you actually build that thing and you're like, well, you know, it's, it's just following my instructions. It's doing the same thing over and over again. So you think there must be something missing. And some other attribute artists have uh, that um, mine doesn't have. And so it just has to have that other thing. And for Harold Cohen, it was this modifiable worldview. Um, so I call these attribute theories of art that you say, well, an artist had a certain set of attributes, like they make, they make nice pictures or they're creative or they make things that are surprising or that they have intent. And so all we have to do is make a computer that has those attributes and that will make an artist. And in all these cases, once you do this, you know, you still have an algorithm executing code that you wrote. It's still basically just following its instructions. And it's somehow, once you sort of, I think, see that, it's to me, that doesn't, that seems unsatisfying. And moreover, we already have systems that can do all of these things. Like we can make things that seem you know, uh, surprising to us or novel. Um, so for example, the Mandelbrot set from the 1980s is a piece of code that produces these images that the uh, inventor or anyone writing this code could not have foreseen. There's no way you could have looked at the code for the Mandelbrot set and realized it was going to produce so many dazzling and beautiful and interesting visuals. And the code for this uh, algorithm is basically, you know, fits in the slide. It's a very, very simple algorithm, and it creates all these incredibly unpredictable and surprising patterns. You know, after a while, it, it becomes more predictable, but for long, but I think it, you know, at least for a while, fulfills all of those criteria I gave. Um, and in fact, there's a nice paper by, called Creative Sparks that demonstrates you can come up with very simple procedures for producing things that experts will be rated as more creative than um, what you know, average people can produce. Um, and this is without any, any code. It's just a very simple procedure, which I don't want to get into the details of. But the point is that very simple procedures can seem very creative. Um, and now, of course, we have uh, Dolly. So you type a bunch of text into the, the um, uh, you know, search bar, and it just produces six images that all seem amazing uh, and beautiful. Um, but, you know, and when I first saw this, I'm like, wow, this, this thing is like a better artist than I am. And it does it just in seconds. And then it's like actually better artist than any human alive in the sense that you can type you all these different styles, produce these great images in just a few seconds. And the thing is that these are um, uh, the data fitting, the training is just data fitting and the model once it's trained is just matrix multiplication and thresholding. These deep neural networks are very simple to, uh, pieces of code uh, in, in some level. It's again, statistics one-on-one -on -one, uh, highly turbocharged. And so these are very simple algorithms that you can understand at a high level, very much how they work. And so it's really hard to, I think, see this as an artist rather than something which is following instructions and fitting data that has been provided to it. Um, now, often, uh, sometimes when I present this, people say, aren't we just computers also? Um, and I, I think this is a little bit um, uh, misleading, this, this, or you know, I, I don't think this is quite true. Uh, now, People argue this, and the answer is, depends on your definition. If by computers you mean, you know, things that could hypothetically be simulated, then maybe um, we live in a, a world, you know, presumably governed by physics, even though we don't understand it. But if by computer we mean the things that we can actually build, like our laptops uh, and our phones, we are not those computers. We're, we definitely cannot uh, equate ourselves to that. We are people, and our computers are not people, and that to me is is the essential difference. We don't know what makes someone a person. So even if it is a deterministic process that could be simulated, we don't know what it is. And we, it's too far, too much of science fiction to even reason about that. And I think there's a, an important gap here that we're thinking about, which is morality. We have morality that applies to people that doesn't apply to computers. So this is a, a, this demonstrates significant difference. Uh, it's okay to turn off computers and to kill all your processes and recycle the machine and not to do without people. And someone who thinks that it's okay is a sociopath. Um, so this And this is not something that can be explained through computation. We don't know scientifically how to explain this in detail or how to build computers that are equivalent to people morally or or in, the, in these senses. Um, and, you know, another thing which I think important to remember, bad art is also art. So, quality of art you produce is not really salient to whether or not it's art. If, you know, a you know, child makes a drawing, it's not going to be hanging in the tape, but it's still art and it's still something that some people will appreciate. Um, and then one thing that people talk about a lot in, in the notion of art and is the idea that artist has an intent uh, or the artist is expressing something. And this is also part of certain historical notions of, of art, definitions of art. Um, I just, I don't, um, 
there's a variety of reasons why I don't think these are good definitions of art or they're not comprehensive. Um, or, or rather, I should say, they're not, um, they don't answer a question about computer arts because we can build machines that automate these things. You could have code that, you know, takes, you know, generates an intent. My intent is to make art. That art will be a painting that depicts horrors of war. Um, and, you know, you could just type in whatever intent you want into Dolly or you can generate those things directly. They will have some emotional expression. They'll express something. We can do these things. Um, and so that doesn't really, you know, answer the question, I think. Um, there's been a few times when I've presented versions of this talk um, to computer scientists and more than once someone raised their hands and say, oh, well, you just have to uh, look at the definition of art and that will tell you the answer to this question of whether computers can be artists. And that's really not how definitions of arts are created. When people uh, come up with definitions of art in, philosophically, they are attempting to describe existing practices and say all these things that we call art and all these things that we don't call art, what separates them and what defines uh, this class. They don't, and we, we have no experience with real non-human artists that we agree are artists. Um, and so the definitions just don't tell us anything about this. This is a, a really a question about the future. So I wanna come back to this idea that whatever an artist does can be art. And you know, the formal name, this relates to the institutional definition of art or specifically the institutional historical definition by Gerald, uh, um, not Stevenson, anyways, this relates to some philosophical definition, but let's just say this is the definition of art. The real question is, what can be an artist? And I want to advance the hypothesis here that art is really a social behavior, and the social nature of art is fundamental to what makes things art. Um, and specifically, the art is something that we do for our social relationships with other people. Um, now, broadly, there are other things that are social relationships that are not art, but the examples are conversation and gifts and uh, marriage, sports and games and fashion. These may have other functions, but a lot of these things are about building or affecting our social relationships. And I would include art in this category um, because making art can be solitary some, in some cases. Um, but once we have it, we don't usually, we don't just throw it away. We share it with other people. We see and appreciate our, you know, other people's art, especially our friends and family. Uh, we talk about it, we buy it and sell it, and we display the expensive art that we bought. Um, once we display it, we use it to demonstrate our status or our values or our affiliations. Um, and I, I, I agree very much with Hockey, who says that art is all about sharing. You wouldn't be an artist if you didn't want to share an experience or a thought or, or something else. Um, and moreover, I, I I suspect I would, you know, uh, hypothesize that there's an evolutionary basis for this. And I'm really inspired by this wonderful book called The Art Instinct by Dennis Dutton. He observes that uh, the art um, can arise from these evolutionary reasons that would have been relevant to our Pleistocene ancestors of sharing of gifts and displays of fitness for mating, displays of social status and tribal affiliation and communication. And my main observation here is that all of these are more to varying degrees about our relationships for other with other people. So these are all uh, social uh, interactions. And so um, put another way, I'm claiming that art can only be capable by agents that are part of these kinds of social relationships. And really what I mean, people, if we see it as a, as a person and we would have a social relationship with it as a result of that, um, then we would then we see it as potentially an artist. So for example, we've talked, there have been various examples of artists being, uh, animals being put forward as artists. Uh, I think we're often quite open to the idea of animals as artists because we recognize them as social creatures. People often have social relationships with, especially with their pets. And really the question is to what degree does the, you know, the monkey flinging paint at the, the canvas, do they care about the images uh, or is it just the activity uh, or some kind of training that they care about? Uh, conversely, natural processes can uh, create wonderful experiences and uh, dramatic and intense experiences, the kind that have been ascribed to art historically. And yet we, at least in the Western tradition, don't consider these things to be art or artists. It's, it's really separate because there is no uh, social relationship or no person behind it. Um, and really the, uh, the authorship and process matter. So this is a, a picture I have on my wall that I really liked. Uh, I feel like some people who come to my play, my house don't you know take pay a lot of attention to it until I point out that it was created by uh, Tom White when he ran a numerical optimization algorithm that automatically arranges strokes on a page to 
maximize the classification score that a neural network applies to this uh, as cello. So in other words, you take, show this picture to uh, image classifiers, VGG or Google image uh, recognition. It says with 99% confidence, this is a cello. And to me, that makes this image a lot more interesting um, than if, I, if you didn't know that. Um, when I've given this talk before, people have also sometimes said, well, I just make art for myself. Um, or they, you know, there's a few examples of uh, outsider artists who didn't share their work with anyone like, like Henry Darker. Um, and I think, you know, and, but I don't think this disproves the theory uh, or the hypothesis. We have lots of behaviors that are evolved that end up being pleasurable for their own sake. So for example, our ancestors ran to survive, but people will now run for fun. And perhaps more relevant is that the evolutionary purpose of speech is communication, but we still, you know, talk to ourselves or sing in the shower. That doesn't disprove that uh, speech is really an, uh, evolved for communication with other people. Um, so with that, according to that hypothesis, I think we can give provisional answers to the question of when in the future a computer could be an artist. Um, so if we develop conscious human level AI, then by definition, of course, these things could be artists. But this is science fiction. It's something that might never happen. Maybe it won't happen in our lifetimes or decades. We This is so far off of our current horizon that it's almost a distraction to talk about it. Um, what about social and conversational AI? We have all these chatbots like Eliza and uh, Twitter bots and Siri and Cortana and uh, Alexa and Neko Atsume and Parotherapeutic Seuls that people have sort of social-like relationships with. But once they understand what's going on under the hood, then they don't, you know, they um, they they can even feel tricked by the social relationship. Like it's not, it doesn't feel like a deep, real relationship. So it's possible that people could be fooled into thinking that they're real and have any social relationships, but I I think it's unlikely and I, and I hope it doesn't happen because I think that would be bad for understanding of, of AI. Uh, and for like the sort of non-social things, like you get pull some code and run that code, um, write some, but write code that produces images. Um, I just don't see how, if people really understand how these things work, that those algorithms could be really treated as artists. Um, I also think the social theory, um, for me, I found it helpful in various ways to, to think about the role of the relationship technology and art. And one example is computer art as has really struggled to gain popularity. There's decades of an anecdotes, people working in sort of media art space and processing and generative arts who just not received any uh, love from you know, the wider community. And I think a lot of this uh, is because when we see artworks, we want to have some, some, some sense of the person behind it. And when people don't know much about programming or much about generative art, then it's very alienating. We just see these cool generated pictures flying around. You can't conceptualize the person writing code to make that and iterating with that. Then it's just like, what is this, this set of pixels? I want to know more. I want You want, really want to have some sense of, of where that came from and the person behind it. Now, that said, uh, you know, one of my main points here is that new technology helps art stay vital. It pushes it to new direct directions and new notions of what it means to be an artist. And an art that doesn't change grows stale. Um, and these things are hard to predict. We, it's hard for us to think about, we have this new technology. What are all the new things that are come out, gonna come out of it when we're just looking at this thing at the time? So here's Les Paul, who's one of the uh, main innovators of the electric solid body guitar, essentially the inventor. And he played these really nice uh, jazz and country and show tunes on the guitar and um, you know Django Reinhardt style is like really pleasant stuff. But there's just no way that he or anyone in his time could have predicted the effect of the electric guitar on popular culture or all of the different things people were going to do with it. Um, we just don't know how our, how our tools are going to evolve and create things we could not have uh, predicted. And if someone in the 1940s was saying like you shouldn't invent this electric guitar because it's like it's you know it's it's destroying music because it's not really good stuff, then you know they're they're, they would be essentially be cutting off all this creativity, and new art forms that, that came in the decades following. So I've just been telling you all this time that we can't make predictions and now I want to make some predictions. Um, but I think these are safe predictions because I'm predicting that the same thing is going to happen that happened with all these other technological developments. And it's not just painting and oil paint and uh, photography and electric guitars. It's also digital film uh, uh, editing, 
um, uh, and a variety of other different uh, technologies that have come along, you know, uh, TV and movies or recorded music that have disrupted uh, traditional art forms. The first is that, like with the electric guitar, the future AI tools are not going to look like the initial tools. So if we want to think about what AI in the future is going to look like, or these you know, AI art tools, it's not going to look like text image. So we people are saying text image is like not really art or it's not very good. It's going to change. It's going to be something different than whatever the tools we have are right now. All we can say is that something really interesting is happening. The second is that artists are going to find great ways to use these tools and new styles and genres and subcultures and techniques are going to uh, emerge with these new tools, just as they have for uh, new kinds of art, uh, other new technologies and art. Uh, more people are going to be able to create and communicate just because of the gap uh, from going from an idea to uh, working with that idea to iterating on it, it's going to be a lot quicker. Um, and just the way you can make a digital video for TikTok or YouTube, or whatever, on your own. Um, uh, whereas you would need a, a team of film editors manually cutting up film 30 years ago, now you're going to be able to you know, be able to do things that were, would require a team now. Um, some technical skills would be less, less important, and so um, <clears throat> you know, like you know, the act of making a, a, a painting again is going to be um, there are cases where it'll be less important than it was before, but there will be more art, uh, jobs for artists because good art will always be hard to make. Um, once the tools become better, the bar for good stuff becomes even better. Anything that's easy to do becomes, it, it's not great art um, in the sense that uh, the things we really appreciate were this result of this entire process of artists working hard, exploring ideas, doing something new and different, um, and really expressing themselves in a way that goes beyond just direct applications to the tools. And so um, we're always going to need artists, and um, the skills of being an artist are also going to evolve and um, uh, grow with the new technologies. And anyone who has these artistic skills are going to find new ways to apply them. So to conclude, um, uh, my main points here are that new technologies are tools that benefit, broadly speaking, art and artists and, and in the net. I believe art is a social activity. It's something we do for primarily social reasons. Um, and as a result, I just don't see how software can, can be considered artists anytime soon, um, as long as people understand uh, really what AI, you know, is. Um, and there's a lot of harm to saying uh, AI is artists because it gives people a lot of false impression of what uh, AI is. Um, and just, I've just, it's been so exciting over the past uh, several years watching artists play with, you know, Deep Dream and GANs um, and VAEs and all this stuff and seeing every new time a new, um, a uh, bit, bit, bit of code goes to GitHub. There's a bunch of AIRs who play with it and do really cool stuff and make I think really nice stuff. And it's just so fun to watch all of the new stuff that's coming out as a result of these, these new technologies. Uh, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Aaron. That was fantastic. I really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really happy that you, sh I'm gonna share my screen here a second because um, I'm really happy that you mentioned about artists finding new ways to use tools. Um, our next uh, event uh, we're going to do is uh, going to feature several artists that are using AI tools, and they'll talk about the artwork they're creating and how they're using those tools. Um, so we're hoping to schedule that in November. Um, if you want to know about our events, uh, like the events I mentioned earlier, uh, follow us on Facebook for now is probably the best way to do it or you may receive an email um, if you're attending uh, and notifying you about an upcoming uh, event. And as always, we'd appreciate that people spread the word, let other people know. Our goal is to you know, inform people about cool things that are happening in uh, art and computer graphics uh, um, and the world at large. So um, with that, let's go to some questions. Um, and... We've got a few here. Um, okay, one question uh, from Denise is, I too have a background in both art and computer science. How do we prevent human non-artists from taking or getting credit for visual art that was created by simply giving a few words to an AI? Yeah, I, I don't think I have a good answer for this because it's, um, you know, these are social, political, regulatory questions in a way. Um, you know, I think 
ideally we're honest with how things are created or um, when artists are um, presenting their work, if they are not revealing their process, they're at least, you know, giving enough information to understand these things. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to this question beyond people should be honest, which is maybe, I don't know if that's a great answer. Yeah, it's a tough one to answer. And I really like in your presentation that you address so many different aspects of, you know, what art, what is considered art, um, you know, technology with art goes so far back, even frescoes at one point was, you know, cutting edge technology with art frescoes. Um, so uh, it's come a long way. Um, another question, but what about IP, intellectual property, from all the artists whose art is used to feed those AI tools? These tools are based on imagery that's gathered, um, you know, do they deserve credit for and then I'm curious about this as well so let's say I make an image and I say oh wow I, I created this with Dolly it's really cool I'm really proud of it I sign it Henry Lewanta created this cool image well really it was generated by all these other images um is there uh you know, some thinking about legally what's involved there or ethically yeah this is a really hot topic and I'm definitely not going to take a, a stand here because this is a big conversation going on right now I don't I don't I certainly don't know the answer um, I'll, I can say a few things. Um, so one thing I just want to say, like AI art is something, which is, you know, like, it, like I mentioned, it's going back many decades and it's really with some of the recent tools that this is a big question. Um, and I think, you know, there's different sides. Um, I think, you know, we, humans always, um, are building on other art, artworks when they make art. So in, it's a big aspect of inspiration that you know, there's this notion everything is a remix. There's wonderful videos on YouTube that um, I think Kirby, I forget his last name, like did like wonderful things to watch. Just every piece of art from Homer's, you know, Iliad to modern movies and everything is, you know, Star Wars. It's building on all these other works of art. So this notion of inspiration, building from things we've seen before, something people have been doing forever. Um, Within the copyright world, there's all these different, you know, remix and sampling and sampling beats and sampling Seamus Brown's grunts are, are things that have been explored in the legal space. And I just, I, I, I don't, um, I don't know how that's going to shake out for AI art. Um, I think um, as one of the comment I was going to make, um, I think what I, you know, I think the discussion should be around attribution and credit for these AI models. There's a lot of discussion here where people are saying like the, the models are copying from the artists and that's really not the case. But there are empirical scientific questions of attribution. So to what extent does this picture depend on this image in the training set? We don't have any way of answering right, that right now. There are a few research papers that address that, but I feel like even just having some better notion of, of how the training data produce an individual output and what the actual percentages were, um, would be would be really illuminating. Um, I I feel like there there are a lot more things to say about that. Again, I don't know what the right answer is, but I'll I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there's a follow up question, a similar question. I think you already touched on it, but I'll, I'll I'll verbalize it here. Is there not a way that as machine learning is involved, training on large model sets of data, that this is not akin to licensing in music? Why shouldn't people and organizations who scrape all known knowledge to train not have to pay some fees to the originators? <laughs> yeah, and I think, and I guess actually another point I want to make, and maybe I should have a slide of this, is that I think AI art ethics is really AI ethics. And every question we have about ethics in the world of AI art is really a broader question about ethics and AI. So for example, um, if we talk about uh, scraping data from the web, a lot of big companies are scraping lots of data from the web and using our private data to build these giant mo models. In some cases, we may have consented or maybe we didn't know we were clicking. In some cases, we didn't, uh, we weren't involved. And so that, I think there's a broader societal question around to what extent can you train a model of anything, which whether or not we're, we're conscious, uh, aware of it or whether or not the model is visible. Um, and I know some of the proposed EU regulation and the White House has this new AI right blueprint from a few days ago they sort of touch on these issues um and i think uh it'll be really interesting to see what the whether those have any teeth what the conclusions of them are and i feel like whatever the ethical decisions that come out of that are really the ones that are relevant for 
uh, training these large models as well. Uh, because they are, like, like I said, they're not directly copying, so it's a little different from sampling and music. I, at least we don't empirically have any reason to believe that, you know, when I type uh, clown bear disco dancing, like there was no clown bear disco dancing in the, in the training data set. It, it's just not copying any specific single example. Yeah. Um, so as you expected, this is a hot topic. <laughs> And, and here, here's another one um, also circling around the same subject we're discussing. The concept of artists is a profession or categorization, um, categorization given to human being with conscious. Why is it so hard for people to understand that computers and applications do not have conscious consciousness, I assume, and therefore not sentient? Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I can just give my own little armchair psychology, which is, you know, like I mentioned in, in the talk that we have this really tendency to anthropomorphize things that, you know, our ancient ancestors would assign um, uh, consciousness to you know, uh, the trees and the sky, like Apollo and Zeus and um, this an uh, animism is the, the name for it. Um, and once we understand these things scientifically, or we have some more uh, mechanistic view of the world, then we um, we can pull back from those anthropomorphism and this notion of uh, intent. But, you know, we always have this in, in, attempt to make sense of the world around us. And for a lot of people, for most of the people in the world, like computers are like a very mysterious thing. If you have never written code or really dug into the guts of it, it's, it's a very foreign thing. And in a way, our computer systems do a poor uh, service to people in terms of helping them really understand uh, what these things are. Uh, and like I mentioned, I also think there's a lot of media hype that really portrays um, uh, the notion of AI as intelligent. And then all of our fiction, like I mentioned, it's, you know, it's Terminator, it's um, C3PO. And um, we tell these narrative stories, which are wonderful stories about uh, robots and AIs that um, are not useful guides to how the real world works. Um, okay. Uh, this is just a comment. Yes, in my culture, we have spiritual consciousness. Um, and another one, um, well, they're not even asking artists for their consent to include their work in the training to, that's a tough one. Cause I, do you have an idea? Is it millions and millions of images that go into this training? Like basically anything they can scrape off of Google images, uh, uh, yeah, the data sets are enormous, and you can look up on, uh, from, for example, the Lion. Um, so some 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 cases are public and some are not. So like the Stable Diffusion is trained on Lion, and so it's, everything's public. You can see, you can type search uh, in the um, data set and see whether your images were used and which websites they were used, and it's clear it's just a massive trawling operation. And it, you know, again, it's the same questions about AI ethics in general. we go oh boy um let me just see i think we got another one here oh somebody wants to see a particular slide i just wanted to let you guys know that we are recording this presentation and assuming it's okay with aaron uh, this will likely be found on youtube um so i imagine you could just uh, search for his name and and you'll you'll be able to see all those slides again i want to go over it again it was just so dense there's so much great stuff there it's amazing um and uh, uh I saw that, uh, I think, um, sorry, uh, might be missing one question. Uh, Cassidy, did you have a question? You can just speak up, um, just un unmute. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, on the, on the same question of the, the kind of ethics of, of uh, um, the ethics of, of uh, models that are trained using art created by artists living or dead, um, there's a lot of the discussion that I'm seeing online is around using the name of an artist as part of the prompt. You know, I want this, you know, I want my clown teddy bear in the style of Greg Rutkowski or, you know, Simon Stalinhog or something. And um, there's, a, you know, that, that's, you know, you see these names, particular names that, that are very popular. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, feeling very excited about the quality of the work that they're getting as a result of that. Um, so I, I don't know, would love to hear your thoughts on 
you know, what are the ethical uh, uh, implications there? You know, what kinds of guardrails should we put in place, you know, to, to protect the rights of, of artists there? Yeah, um, and again, I mean, I said like, you know, I should have mentioned before, like I, I, it's really, you know, not surprising that there are a lot of artists who are really upset and afraid and concerned and angry. Like it makes, it, it's, it's completely, these are completely reasonable reactions because this technology is very scary. And it's really unclear um, where it's going to go. Um, I think, you know, I I would say with respect to that question, it relates again a lot to my um, uh, comments about you know broader AI ethics. I think the one thing that's different about when you say in the style of specific artist, then um, then the attribution is pretty clear. It's clear that that is based on training data from that artist, and that's one thing that you can say for sure. Um, to me, that's the really the salient difference. Um, I want to make one other comment, which is a bit of an aside, it doesn't really relate to your question directly, which is that when you say um, you make uh, an artwork in this style of artist name, you're not actually reproducing, you're not making an art, artwork like that artist. Uh, you're not using their the context of the, that they're working and their intention. And moreover, it often doesn't capture their style exactly. It's some new style. It's, to, to, to me, that's really a new generative art which is using training data in some way. And when you sort of, you know, people learn to like write prompts that say like 4K Ultra Station HD and so on, they're learning these tools that are not reproducing the training data, but doing some new thing, which is some combination of it. Um, I just want to mention one other uh, like anecdote or aside. Um, you know, these things are being received differently in different communities. And so it, obviously some um, people are, are very scared for what it means for, for their work, especially when their artwork is being used. Uh, to potentially displace them. So that's, you know, really troubling. Um, in other communities, so like in ar the architecture world, like I was, you know, talking with a group of architects who are just using this stuff, uh, we're really excited about. So the principal architect of Zaha Hadid, uh, in one of the presentations we were on, was showing all of these Zaha Hadid style images he was making with Mid Journey and really excited about it. Because for him, this is just helping him uh, uh, experiment with yeah, uh, conceptualize new images and new designs. And it's not, you know, in, for them, it'd be part of their creative process, things they would show to clients, but it's never going to replace their final output, which is actual buildings. There's a question here I, I, I was interested in as well. Um, you know, I'm sure artists have always, musicians have always been inspired by other artworks or other music. And use those to influence what they're creating so this question is aren't humans susceptible to seeing an image sub and subconsciously use it in some form in a future artworks absolutely and and that's kind of what we're doing with the training also um so we all learn from each other <laughs> i don't think anything's 100 percent original yeah and there's the you know, arguments break out and like is this artist just copying that other artist's style are they original or not yeah uh, here's a, another angle. It's kind of interesting. Google's CAPTCHA, um, you know, that does the um, confirmation of your identity, uses all of us users to train, and it never described to us users underneath a CAPTCHA what the CAPTCHA technology is doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, there's a lot of data being used in lots of ways these days. Beware. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's most of the questions there. There was one question about, I'm just going to share my screen again here, about um, if uh, we need a webmaster, who to contact. You can send me an email. Um, I'll give you a, an older email address of mine. It's h, just h, l-a-b-o-u-n-t-a at yahoo.com. So yeah, if you want to send me uh, an email at hlabonta at yahoo.com, if you uh, can create websites and are a bit of a webmaster of sorts, um, that would be fantastic. We'd love to get our, our website back up and running. And, and we're just all volunteers um, making this happen. Um, and uh, because we, we love um, this amazing work um, and uh, uh, technology. Um, so uh, I think you did a fantastic job of addressing some of the hot button topics um, there, Aaron. I really appreciate your uh, doing this. Uh, we got several comments here. An awesome, thought provoking presentation. Um, so, um, you know, um, uh, yeah. So, the, I'll, I'll give you one last question here and then we'll wrap up. Um, 
what replaces the Turing test to show that we have passed the threshold? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think you know people are debating what is AI, what is AGI. We don't really have a good answer. Um, so the classic Turing test is you know convince someone conversationally you're a human. This is all already 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 been passed. We, as my understand it, when people hold Turing test competitions, like depending on how broadly you you do it, computers can pass it. But we don't think of them as being you know really intelligent. Um, and the same thing with artworks. We can produce artworks with computers that you know are good in, for some definition, as good as uh, humans can make. Um, to me, it's all about um, consciousness or about when are they people? When do we have? When are they real and really intelligent? And that we have no idea about if that's ever going to happen. So I just don't see computers being artists. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I think that's probably, oh, this was terrific. Everybody, yeah, thank you. Very interesting. So uh, audience is really appreciating your talk. Um, and uh, as I do as well, um, thank you for the, taking the time to share this knowledge um, you have. I had asked a few people um, when we were setting this up, um, you know, hey, who, who should I talk to about this? And completely different people were like, you need to talk to Aaron Hertzman. He's been thinking about this for a long time and working on it. And um, so I'm, I'm really happy to um, uh, get your presentation, your thoughts on this. That's super helpful, especially at this juncture in, in art and technology. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for attending uh, and uh, you know, hope to see you at our next presentation. We'll have, that will be more focused on artists using this kind of technology and hearing them talk about their process. Um, and uh, please, uh, please keep in touch. Thank you everybody. Hey, Thanks Aaron. Thank you.